very brave run here by Paul Sturrock to the goal line. He's got to have a support, and he does from Frank Kuppel. <laughs> That's what he is, one of the best goals I've ever seen in Europe. He thoroughly deserved that. Sturrock did all the running for it, and when it left, Kuppel's foot went at about 70 miles an hour into the back of the net. I don't think Luggy meant to actually cross the ball to Frank that, that day, but thank goodness it landed at Frankie's feet. And as, as Frankie says, the ball came to his feet, he hit it, he then shut his eyes, and the next thing he knew, it was, you know, in the back of the net. And and I do remember one of the Anderlecht guys saying to me, it silenced a stadium. When we were 8 and 10, we lived across the road from each other uh, in Falkirk, two very proud um, Falkirk bairns. And uh, and of course, Falkirk motto, touch in, touch all, better tangle with the devil than a bairn for Falkirk. He was coming out his, his uh, path, coming out his, down his path, a football under his arm, and I was coming out my path. And he just looked across and he said, are you going to the park to play? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, are you going to play football? And I went, what? I says, I'm certainly not going to play football. I says, I'm a girl. And, you know, I'm eight years old. He's 10. So we took those away down to the park. And, um, you know, I always say to people, for people who actually know me, uh, and you'll realise this, Paul, you have probably in the last hour, um, I was the one doing all the talking and Frankie was the one doing the listening. And... I went away, played in the park on the shoots and the swings with my friends and he played football with his pals. Um, he came running across to me and said, come on, Amanda, do you want to play football? I'll teach you. And I said, no. I says, I don't. I've told you. I says, Frankie, I'll get hurt. I'm a girl. And he took my hand, this 10-year-old wee boy with the massive dark curly hair, and he just said, Amanda, I'll never let anybody hurt you. And he never, ever did. You know, for that day until the day he passed away in my arms, he never ever did. A few years later, we um, we were at a friend's party. I was nearly 12, Frankie was 13, and that's where we shared our first kiss, a game called Postman's Knock. And uh, as we were all walking up the road that night, we got to the gate, and there was, you know, there was a few years, and Frankie and I were standing, and he just says, do you want to, he says, um, go out on a date tomorrow? And I said, yeah. And and I always remember that was a Friday night. And he says, right, I'll pick you up. He says, at 12 o'clock. So he came across, 12 o'clock. We walked up to Alexander's bus station in Falkirk. And we got on a bus to Alawa. I still didn't have a clue where we were going. And we ended up at this, the Alawa versus Stirling Albion game at Recreation Park. And that was my first introduction, I must admit, to football um, as such and I, I do know that in a, you know, years later I would torment Frankie about our first date Alma, you know, a athletic to a football match he says Amanda it was a cup tie you know so <laughs> I used to say to him what are you going to do when you leave school he says I'm going to be a footballer and I, I, I said yeah but what are you going to do as a wage what are you going to do actually to earn a wage? He says, Amanda, I want to be a footballer. I'm going to be a footballer. And I used to say, all right, OK, then. You know, one of the Man United scouts came and was watching him. And the next thing, um, you know, he signed as a young apprentice for Man United under the late great Sir Mark Busby. would write to each other every single day. We said, why don't you come down and stay in Manchester? I managed to get a job in the bank down there, Williams Deacons it was called at the time. Every year Man United had a dance, a dinner dance in the Midland Hotel in Manchester. And one of the one of the times I was down, we were sitting with one of our friends, Chris Rimmer, 
and I looked across and who was sitting right across from me was George Best. And you can imagine I'm in a 16 and a half year old girl, you know, and here's this superstar. And he just went, hello. And I thought, oh. <laughs> Best at 22 is already a hero throughout the world of football. Like Matthews and Pelly and Eusebio, his is a name that will put 10,000 on the gate wherever he plays, whether it be Manchester or Montevideo. He's the outstanding example of the young players who've grown up in football since the new wage deal eight years ago. His attitudes are not those of an athlete, but of a pop star. The same can be said of his salary. He earns between 20 and 30,000 pounds a year, has a three-year contract as a male model, owns two boutiques and two motor cars, which at present he cannot drive due to an unfortunate brush with the law. And, um, I, I mean, I was totally speechless, you know, because I could not believe George Bass was sitting right across from me. And Frankie just said, George, he says, this is my girlfriend, Amanda. And George says, I'm pleased to meet you, Amanda. And he, he leaned across the table and he gave me a cuddle. And I thought, I'm not going to wash for a week, you know, because so we I go back to Falkirk and, you know, tell them that I got a, a hug for George Best. I always got the train into Piccadilly Circus. And we would go across to Piccadilly, um, to the bus station and that, and go out to Stratford. And uh, the next thing... Uh, Frankie says to me, we're not going in the bus today. We're, we're travelling in style to Stratford. And I said, all right. So we walks to this white Jaguar car. And I thought, oh, my God. And I thought, Frankie was an apprentice at the time. And I thought, how on earth has he, he got enough money to, to rent, that sort of thing. And he says, this is George's car. The internationalists, if they were going away on international duty, like George, were like maybe playing in London, they would leave their cars at the ground uh, on the Friday and pick it up then on the, the, the Sunday. And George had went into the dressing room and just said that that weekend, well, that on the Friday, you know, he had said to Frankie, what are you doing for the weekend, Frank? And Frankie says, oh, I'm, he says, I'm, um, Amanda's coming down for Falkirk. He says, oh, well, there's the keys in my car. He says, just you and her run about in it. And we did. <laughs> we ran about in it, you know, for the Friday, um, right to the, the, the Sunday night. And it was quite funny because you could see people in Manchester who knew Georgie Best's car, you know, and they would say, here's Georgie Best coming, you know, and maybe stopping at lights and that. And they'd look in and they'd say, who are they to? <laughs> sort of thing. Came home to get married in 1969. And by that time, Frankie had been transferred to Blackburn Rovers. We were at Blackburn Rovers for three years. In fact, that's where Scott, our son, was born. Things really weren't working out for Frankie. You know, there was a change of manager um, who didn't like Frankie's style of play. Twelve o'clock, phone rang, and I picked it up. And, um, I heard the voice saying... I uh, can speak to Frank, and I said, no, I'm sorry. I said, he's, 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 he's at training. Can I help you? He said, my name's Jim McLean. He says, I'm the new manager of Dundee United. He says, um, I'm wondering if Frank would be interested in, in joining us. And he says, I've heard he's not, um, you know, settled at Blackburn. And, of course, me being me, I said, no, you're right. I says, he's got a manager. I says, doesn't like him, and he doesn't like him, and do, 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 do. <laughs> Jim McLean knew at that point, you know, that he had a wife that, you know, Frank had a wife that talked too much. And um, anyway, three o'clock, I says, I'll get him to phone you, Mr McLean. And three o'clock, Frankie came in and I just said to him, there's somebody called Jim McLean, new manager at Dundee United. I says, he wants you to phone him, there's his number. And I went away through to the kitchen and he... Uh, the next thing, Frankie just came through and he said, Amanda, he says, you know, pack some things up in the case for me, you and Scott. And we had a wee home and imp at that point. And uh, we travelled up to Scotland, Hogmanay that night. We managed to get to my parents' house um, in time for the bells. 
and Frankie became Jim's first sign in the following day on the 1st of January 1972. be completely honest it's selfish but all I wanted to be was successful as a manager uh, and uh, at the end of the day it was a great opportunity. His tactics and his training and his coaching methods were brilliant. One time we had a practice match in the morning against the reserves and we lost in the morning so he had his back in the afternoon. We lost in the afternoon and he had his back at night so we had three games that day until he got it right so that was uh, the type of manager he was. Kirkwood is still down, but that's a good ball to Pettigrew. Still a chance. He's caught. Al-Capel, Savannah, beautifully cultured player, Bannon. Holt, Stark on the left again. Fleming is inside, this pretty good it! I think there was always a bond between Frankie and Jim because he was his first signing. But he was also, we all know what Jim could be like. You know, there was two sides to Jim. You know, there was the, the player's side of him. Hey, D-Bag! D-Bag! Hey, oh! ball! Hold that ball! Don't do that! Kick it away, I'll boot you! Hey, kick it! Somebody run the back of Haggy! D-Bag! David! Well, there's, for instance, there was one day that Gwen Kirkwood and I, Bully Kirkwood's wife and I, we worked in the Bank of Scotland at Fairmuir, and the players came in one day, and it was on the first day, came in with a wages check. I mean, the, the, they, had, they had a pittance that week, right? And I'm looking, you know, and I says to Frankie, where's the rest of your wages? He says, oh, the boss find us. I says, that's shocking, you know. So I said to my boss, can I can use your phone now. And he says, yeah. So, of course, I phoned Jim up. And I says, Jim. And he says, what do you want? You know, well, there was a few expletives um, for Jim. <laughs> and I says, listen, I says, I've got, I says, the players, I says, standing out in the banking hall, I says, and they've all got, I says, the same amount. And it was something ridiculous. And I says, I says, you find the wages. He says, yeah, well, they didn't get the fans can value for their money, as is Jim. <laughs> the one for one on Saturday. And then there was another time, Paul, that at the old Tanadice, the, the, after the game, the players' wives used to just stand down in the wee sort of entrance hall. And I remember it was it was a winter's day and it was freezing. And all the kids, all our kids were all running about and running about. And all the directors' wives and that were coming down the stairs after, you know, um, the game and all that. And Jim came down <laughs> with hands in his pocket and he goes, oh, as usual. And, and I says, Jim. And he went, what is that? And I says, Jim, we're all standing here like frozen snotters. I says, the Bairns, I says, are having to run about, I says, trying to keep them. I says, where is, I says, Doris, I says, and the rest of the, I says, 
the rest of the um, the director's wives and that. I says they've all been uh, standing up in a in a room getting a cup of tea after Ken the game and everything. I says, and here's us. I says standing here. I says look at us. I says your noses are all red and everything. And he muttered something, and away we went out. And uh, Mary Fleming, she says, she says, I don't know how she says you get away with all that. And I says, well, it's no right. I says, I'm no bothered about us. I says, but look at the bairns. I says, they're frozen, absolutely frozen. I says, well, is that true that much? I says, no, even as much as I can. I says, all we're wanting is, a, even if they put a heater here, sort of thing, and on the Monday, Frankie came in for training, Paul. And he just said, um, he says, were you heading it in the boss? He says, on Saturday. And I went, well, no. I says, I just, I says, I just mentioned, I says, I mean, he says, well, I got called into the office, he says, and he just said to me, will you tell your wife, he says, that we've made a room available for the wives and the children after the match and there'll be a cup of tea and a sandwiches for them <laughs> to heat them up. <laughs> so give him his due. I did phone him up. And it was the usual, what are you wanting now? And I says, Jim, I just want to say thank you very much on behalf of myself and the wives. But I always remember the story as well to Paul about um, when United played in the Japan Cup. And of course, the, the final was against Tottenham Hotspur. And uh, Ozzy Ardelis, um was playing for Spurs. And of course, Frankie tackled him two or three times. <laughs> Every time... Every time we pass Frankie, he would turn around and go, you son of a pig! <laughs> Frankie would just laugh, which I think made Ozzy even all the more angry. <laughs> but you, you knew it, you just think to yourself, you know, it, it was all these, you know, I, I suppose the, these things, and, you know, Man United, Blackburn Rovers, you know, um, Dundee United, Arbroath, Forfar, and then you fast forward to... 2008 and once again we do not remember days we remember moments I don't remember um, the actual day it was but what I do remember is the, the, the moment when the doctor said to us um, I'm really sorry Frank but your tests are all showing that you have vascular dementia and I kept remembering thinking this doctor is going to say but there is a cure and we'll start treatment tomorrow. But there was silence, you know, there was absolute silence. And I just remember thinking, no, this this is a bad dream. Um, we came home that, that day and I just remember him sitting there and saying to me, oh, well, a man had dementia, it's not the end of the world, is it? And I thought, well, it isn't the end of the world. But it's the end of the world, as him and I knew, you know, for, because I think probably I understood a lot more than what Frankie was maybe, you know, understanding. And uh, because I, I, I suppose at that point, you know, I, I knew that there was no cure anywhere in the world. And unless there was a cure, you know, for anybody who had been diagnosed, um, then there was hope, but there wasn't any hope then. I remember thinking, no, this is not right. You know, here is a man who never smoked, who ate healthily, who exercised twice a day. I thought, he drank only socially. I thought, he's never had any health problems. How on earth could this man have dementia? And, and like that, I, you know, Frankie and I, like a lot of people, would probably have just thought that's a disease of an elderly person. You know, Frankie was 59 at this point. Um, and I thought, no, something, something isn't right here. I remember, um, you know, Frankie going to his bed that night and I phoned one of our friends in, in, in the States and it was him who, first of all, mentioned chronic traumatic encopathy to me and he said that they were dealing with a lot of sportsmen in the States at that point who had been diagnosed with dementia and it was because of trauma to the brain. Grizzly chased off, help came from Miller, then guided along, oh and Craig, he was great trained. Principal point of contact, 
<laughs> it's the head. And that's why there's a penalty there. Berger fires it in there. You're going to see Ike Lopez, number 43, with a big hit to the head. As good as I have ever seen. Rolling on the field is a touchdown. Personal foul, unnecessary. And in the end, it was an awkward chance. It never dropped quickly enough for Matt Yerman, who has opened up his forehead. He's been some contact. This will require some touching up. Oh, into the back of the head. Yeah, above that right eye. A rousing reception for the stand-in skipper. Lately, it's been difficult to talk about football without mentioning concussions. Why? A mounting concern over a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, more commonly known as CTE. In the world of medicine, CTE is a relative newcomer. In football, we just learned about it 10 to 15 years ago. Here's what we can say. It's a progressive degenerative brain disease. It is like Alzheimer's. It can start with memory loss, mood swings, and difficulty in concentration, developing into progressive dementia, even possible thoughts of suicide. But unlike Alzheimer's, CTE can also result in significant aggression and lack of impulse control. The big difference, symptoms tend to begin much earlier in life, closer to your 40s instead of your 60s. In both diseases, there's no known cure. Researchers believe there's only one way to get CTE, and that is repeated hits to the head. What happens is that you get a buildup of an abnormal protein called tau in the brain. Scientists do know both the location of the tau and how much tau in the brain determines the symptoms you might exhibit. But scientists don't yet have a magic number of hits that results in CTE. It also isn't known who exactly would develop CTE. There are some players who take many hits and never develop symptoms. Factors like genetics and age of exposure to the trauma could play a role. A prominent group of researchers have found over 90% of former NFL players have developed CTE. Also, it's not just football players that need to be concerned. Boxers, soccer players, people in the military, anyone who's exposed to constant head trauma can develop it too. You know, I, I keep thinking, you know, that it, it has to be this. It has to be this because he wasn't fitting the criteria um, of somebody with vascular type of dementia. You know, as I say, never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Even now, after 14 and a half years, I'm still learning about dementia. And I always make the point to people that the first few years after the diagnosis, Frankie lived as normal a life as was possible. And I always stipulate that to people, um, you know, because I, I was accused in the past, past about... Um, of, you know, you're scared mongering people who have dementia because you can live perfectly well with it. Of course you can. You can live well after the diagnosis. But as that brain begins to deteriorate, there is nothing normal about your life. There is nothing. And it was the little things that crept up, you know, um, over the, these years. And um, I, I remember one day we were looking at the wedding album. The thing, you you know, I learned very early on, never to say to somebody with dementia, oh, remember this, remember that, you know, because the, the brain can't really take it all in and you, you can see them trying to get quite confused. So you have to word things in a different way. So I said to, I remember looking at the photograph, going through the wedding album and I says to him, oh, I says, here's that young couple, I says, from Falkirk. I says, and they got married. I says, goodness, now. I says, now, I know them. I says, now, wait a minute, now. now and I was trying to pretend, you know, I, I, I didn't know who they were. And then the next thing, Frankie looked and he went, that's me. He says, that's me, that's Frankie, that's me. And I went, oh, my goodness, so it is. I says, and I'm trying to think, the girl that he married, and he went, but that's Amanda, that's my Amanda. And I said, do you know, Frankie, I says, that's right. And then I remember just looking at him and I said, do you know, Frankie, I says, that's me in that photograph. And he looked at me and he looked at the photograph and he looked again at me and he looked at the photograph and then he just started crying. And he said, Amanda, I'm sorry. He says, I didn't recognise you. What's happening to me? I says, Frankie, it doesn't matter, son. I says, That's, that is me. I says, I'm just an older, fatter version now. One of the moments as well, too, he said to me another time, he says, where do you live? 
And and I remember looking at him and thinking, where do I live? And I think that was really when the knife went into me. And I went, where do I live? I says, and I told him. And he went, Kitty Muir. He says, that's where Amanda and I stay. And I says, do you? Because you had to learn to go into his world, you know, um, at that, that point. And I says, yeah. And he went, oh, do you know Amanda? And I went, I don't think I do. He says, well, you'll need to come and visit us. But I warn you now, he says, she talks a lot. <laughs> One here by Paul Sturrock to the goal line. He's got to have a support, and he does from Frank Coppell. Oh. Oh. That's really is one of the best goals I've ever seen in Europe. During his journey with dementia, he, I would play that that goal to him. But there came a time when I remember putting it on one day, and he said, what a goal that is. He says, who scored that? Who was playing? And I says, that's Dundee United and Anderlecht. I says, the Belgian, the Belgian team. He says, all right. He says... Who, who scored that goal? I says, you scored that. And he says, me? And I says, yeah. And he says, I says, you scored that? And didn't have a clue. Do you know one of the, the poignant things, I think, and I can still see the two of them, uh, it was when Jim was starting his, his, uh, his journey with dementia. And Frankie was quite well into his. And as I say, there was always a, a bond between them because, the, you know, because it was his first signing and Jim had been in, in Liff. And Doris had phoned and um, she says, oh, I'm going to see him. And she says, come, you and Frank, come up and see him. So we went up and Jim and her were sitting on the bench outside. It was a lovely summer's day. And um, we went along and Jim says, oh, look who's here. And he says, here's my girlfriend. That's what he would say. Who's my girlfriend? And I went, I said, see, you, you're just a charmer, McLean. Again, just like that. But that was the kind of banter, you know. Um, there was, was, and he said, how are you doing, Frank? And Frank he says, I'm fine, boss. And Frank always called him boss, you know, even to the last. He always called him boss. I'm fine, boss. I'm all right, boss. Struggling a wee bit walking and that, and I get a wee bit lost at times. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. The four of us were sitting there, and Frankie got up, and somebody with dementia always wants to walk, you know, and you can't really stop them. If they want to walk, they need to walk, sort of thing. So Frankie went down two or three wee steps, and there was a grass area, and he was just walking up and down, and Jim says, you need to watch him, Amanda, he's going to fall. And I says, you know, he'll fall, Jim. I says, he's fine, I'm watching him. And he says, no, he'll maybe hurt himself. And he was, you know, he was quite concerned about Frankie falling and hurting himself. And I says, Jim, he's not going to fall. I says, I'm watching him. I says, and if he did fall, he's on the grass. I says, he maybe thinks he's on a park somewhere. I says, so he'll be fine. I says, he can't go anywhere. I says, you know, I says, it's all enclosed. And he, he says, right, he says, okay then. And anyway, he, he was going, Frank, Frank, Frank. Because Frankie was ignoring him. He's going, Frank, Frank, you need to come back. Come on, son, come back. It was like a father, son sort of thing. And uh, anyway, Jim says, no, I'll, I'll need to go down and get him. I'll need to go down and get him. So Jim went down and right enough, he goes up and says, come on, Frank, come back up. And Frankie just went like that, as if to say, get off me, sort of thing. And Jim went, Frank, he says, look, there's there's Amanda and Doris up there and Frank went, he says, Oh so it is. I'm 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 just coming, Amanda. I'm just coming. So he came up the stairs with Jim. And Jim says to me, you know, he says he was not gonna come back. And I says, Jim, I says, he didn't understand you. He says, How did he not understand me? I says, Well maybe if you had says couple got that F and thing where the the strikers go there. I think, you know, finding, well, discovering, I suppose, the discrimination against the under 65s, which we would never have realised. Um, it was quite horrific to think that people with a disease, disability, illness or condition um, 
were discriminated so blatantly. Um, what, because of an age on their birth certificate? You know, time, as we all know, waits for no man or woman. And a lot of these people under the age of 65, they were getting told, just like Frankie, hang on until you're 65 and you'll get that free. You won't be charged with it uh, for it. And I thought, they don't have time on their hands. A lot of these people were going to their grave paying for that personal care. And that was so cruel. It was unfair and it was unjust. 2002, I think it was, well, it was the Labour Lib, Lib Dem Coalition who introduced the, the personal care, the free personal care um, for the over 65s with a view to extend it to the under 65s. But until Frank's Law came along, it had never been discussed to extend it. Um, and, you know, but speaking about it and that, and, and, I th and I think, you know, Frank had lost his job as he deteriorated. I gave up my job to look after him. Um, you know, money was tight. You know, Frank had didn't, you know, make the big wages that a lot of the, you know, the, um, famous footballers these days make. You know, we were struggling to pay the bills and that. Just because dementia came to your door doesn't mean to say that the bills stopped coming in. You know, the household bills that everybody has. Um, you know, gas, electricity, the rates and community charge, whatever. Um, you know, we had a mortgage still at that point. And, um, you know, I had a family who was so helpful, helping with things and good friends as well. But, you know, the... There came a time we thought, right, we're going to have to sell some of his memorabilia, um, which we did. You know, it was things he had collected through his football career. And one of them was his Busby Bay blazer. And, you know, I have to admit, it was, it was quite a... It was quite, I suppose, heartbreaking in one sense. But needs must, you know. And we did sell the blazer. Um, to a, a very avid Man United collector um, and uh, we, uh, basically you, you just had to put it at the back of your mind then, well it's a wee end of story, it kept the wolf from the door for a few, you know, a few months. I think as well to that was as well one of the things that I always made the point Frank and I were lucky in the sense that we had things we could sell in order to pay for these charges. How many people in Scotland weren't as lucky as us? They didn't have things that they could sell. These were the people I was fighting for as well. I, I just remember Frank and I sitting one time and just talking and I said, you know, this is terrible. You're being discriminated against. How many more people are being discriminated again in, uh, against in Scotland? I says, their voices must be getting ignored and that. And that's when, you know, I says to Frank, I wonder who we could maybe complain to. <laughs> and uh, that's when he said, look, Amanda, tell them. It's too late for me, but it's going to help others in the future. And that's when the Frank's Law campaign actually began. And it was basically to, to really... It was not to do with publicity or awards or anything like that. It was just to get the make people aware that the under 65s we had been discriminated against and also to raise awareness that dementia and Alzheimer's was not just a disease of the elderly. That's what we set out to do. Never did we think that it would reach the heights that it, you know, that it actually reached. So many, I think, stones and barriers and everything had been thrown in our, our way during the campaign, you know, to say it's not feasible, it's not affordable, it can't be done, and do, do, do. And it spurred me on even more. Uh, the most difficult days were the ones when I was trying to get through to the politicians. <laughs> there was one I actually said, 
That woman can shout all she wants from the rooftops, we will never deliver Frank's law. But how wrong they were. And uh, because I did keep going, you know, for my soulmate, but for all the under 65s who need it. And of course, it was during the campaign that Frankie lost his battle with dementia. He had been invited up to Tannadice in the February. Um, and it was the last time Frankie was able to walk onto the pitch. It was the Kilmarnock game. Um, and uh, that was quite traumatic trying to even get him to the ground because he, he was, you know, you know, he, he had deteriorated quite a bit. And I kept saying to Scott, I don't know if this is going to work, son. And he, he said, well, mum, he says, you and I will be there. And it was such a special moment, I think, to walk on and the likes of Hamish and Bo and, you know, Big Sash and, you know, his teammates helping them on and Ralphie, God rest his soul, they were all there. And, and, and I always just remember Frankie looking and because he had lost the sight in one of his eye, um, he was really, you know, realising where he was and then all of a sudden, the smile came on his face and he realised when the when the, the fans started clapping and chanting, he realised he was back on the pitch at Tannadice. And the smile on his face and he just started crying. But there were tears of joy. And... It was such a beautiful moment, I must admit, and um, it, it really was very emotional. Um, <laughs> and it was the last time we did ever walk onto the pitch because um, that was in February and he passed away in the April a couple of months later. Scott and I were in the bedroom with him uh, in the house and... The note came to the door and Scott went and answered it. He came back through and he said, Mum, there's a big box for you in the kitchen addressed to you and Dad. And I went through and opened the box and here was this lovely letter from the guy who had previously bought Frankie's blazer. And um, I took the blazer out, hung it on the hanger and I still have the guy's letter to this day. And, and I read it often and he just said that he had heard from one of our friends how seriously old Frankie was and he wanted to gift it back to Frankie. And I just thought, how kind, there's so many kind, kind people, you know, throughout that journey and, and here was one of them. And I, I hung it on the hanger, took it through the bedroom, hung it on the back of the bedroom door and I sat back down beside Frankie and I just said, Frankie, when you, you know, when you're waking up, I says, your blazers came home, your Busby blazers came home. I says, and I hung it on the back of the door. And when you're waking up, you'll see it. And that was a Tuesday and the following morning he passed away in my arms at ten past six. And, you know, I hear people saying that people, whether it's true or not, People choose when they're going to die. Um, and I think Frankie was just waiting for his blazer to come home. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone associated with Dundee United was saddened to hear that former player and Hall of Fame inductee Frank Capel last week lost his brave battle against his cruel illness and passed away at the age of just 65. On the referee's whistle, please do join us in a minute's applause to honour his life. And as I've always said, that, you know, that day that he died in my arms, I, I could have quite happily um, ripped that, that campaign into pieces because he no longer needed that personal care. He, he never, ever did get his, his free personal care. Um, and, I mean, at, at that point, I was 64, so I thought, well, another year, I'm 65, 
as things stand, if I need personal care and I'm assessed as needing it, and that's the important thing, if you're assessed as needing it, not everybody under the age of 65 would ever be assessed as needing it, only a minority. And I thought, well, I'm quite, you know, I, I would be quite right to just tear that, you know, campaign up. But there had been so many people get in touch with me, you know, during the campaign to say, Amanda, will you please keep fighting for us? I think the day that, that Frankie, you know, passed away, um, it was even the following day, I was still getting messages from people. I mean, a lot of lovely, you know, kind condolences um, that people were sending and that. And there was also ones, you know, people pleading with me, saying, please keep going with this campaign. We need, you know, we, we are being discriminated against. As I say, throughout his journey, um, we met so, so many wonderful people. And, and I have to pay special tribute to um, Frank's army. Absolutely. Um, they came from all ages, creeds, colours and genders. They, they came from all over, not only from Scotland, from England, Wales, Ireland, Europe, in fact, the world, you know, and they were, I, I still fondly refer to them as Frank's army. Um, and the people who I do have to also um, say a huge thank you to is um, our Arab family, because they kept me going. Approaching the three minute mark, you will hopefully hear resounding applause as we hit that. And that is in support of Frank's Law, Frankie Copal, United legend. Uh, United fans showing their support for the attempt to make free medical care for those under 65 suffering from dementia. And, you know, some of the politicians listened in that. But thank goodness that there was one came along, the Scottish Conservative guy, um, Miles Briggs, and he just got in touch with me. Could I have a meeting with him? And he was the one who um, basically pushed and pushed and pushed. He got the other opposition parties on his side. Um and I have to say, Alec Neil, who was the SNP, Cabinet Health Minister at the time, I have the utmost respect for Alec as well too. Um, Neil Finlay, the Labour guy, you know, I mean, they, there was a thing, you know, they talk about, you know, politicians being at each other's throats and all that, but it just shows you there was a, a Tory, an SNP and a Labour guy fighting in Frank's corner. On the 1st of April 2019, uh, I once again, I was very proud to, to stand with so many MSPs on the garden lobby steps from all the parties. Um, and uh, with the banner, we delivered Frank's Law. And, and I remember, you know, thinking at the time, um, what message does this give to maybe people all over the United Kingdom. It gives the message that, you know, Scotland, for the, the wee proud country we are, um, you know, it shows what can be done. When we all put our, you know, our heads together and stop this sort of, you know, the, the, the backstabbing and the nitpicking. And, and I like to think that Frankie would be sitting in heaven thinking to himself, you know, you never broke your promise to me, Amanda. You know, you kept telling them. Um, you were probably a pain in the neck to probably a lot of them, and I'm I'm sure I was. In fact, I know I was. And and I think you know, his legacy is 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 certainly, you know, it's it's now law. Um, I think he would be. I know Frankie would be absolutely over the moon to think that his law is helping so many people in Scotland.
have to admit, you know, and, and I do mean it, hand on my heart, for all these awards, all these words of praise that I keep getting and that, and, you know, people say, oh, she's determined, she's tenacious, she's, you know, she's this, she's that, um, you know, um, she's brave and that. No, I'm not. What I am is a folk at Bairn, I says, who was married to her soulmate, um, who's also a very proud folk at Bairn, who just happened to be diagnosed with a disease that robbed him of his life. Um, so anybody, you know, um, if anybody deserves any of these, it's Frankie, because he paid the ultimate price for his life, you know, for Frank's law, um, you know, and if dementia had never come to our door, who knows, you know, we could have been sitting in Calador, um, our favourite holiday place, and um, where actually some of Frankie's ashes are scattered. Um, we we could have been sitting there, you know, all these plans that we had, and but then God laughs at people that make plans, doesn't he? And um, we didn't ever plan for dementia to come and, you know, come into our life. But I know that Frankie walks beside me every single day, and uh, and and I also know that um someday him and I will meet again where the angels learn to fly.